Good morning, everybody. If you guys want to stand, if you guys want to make your way back to your seats, let's start worship. One, two, three, four. I'm casting my cares aside. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, as I've said before, welcome to Grace Bible Church. And this time, though, instead of just my voice coming from the back of the room somewhere, I'm going to come up front. So, um, have you all uh, recovered from Thanksgiving? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, people just, yeah. So, you're still working on leftovers? Okay, so, more important stuff, though. How many of you have all of your Christmas decorations put up yet? Oh, yeah. Some people are real quick to shoot their hand. Now, one more thing. How many of you have finished your Christmas shopping yet? Dad, even a couple hands on that. Wow, I'm impressed. I'm a long, long ways from that. So anyway, welcome to Grace Bible Church. Pastor Dan is taking the week off here, so you're stuck with me uh, doing the announcements. Oh, boy, that is so cute. I love it. So, uh, a lot of announcements to go through here this morning, so I better get going. Um, 
one of the things we're trying to minimize some of the announcements that we make up here. So it's like we only have a full page here today. So, uh, and I'm dropping things on the floor, but that's okay. Okay, so uh, if you are visiting today, we're glad you're here. And uh, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out. And if you want to know what all's going on, that's the thing to do. Make sure you sign up to get our newsletter, and that way we can keep each other in touch on everything. We're trying to only highlight an, one or two activities each Sunday up here, so the, the newsletter is really important to uh, keep informed on what's going on. Um, you can find a copy of that at the uh, table back there, too. And by the way, there's like a gazillion sign-up sheets back there, too. So one of the, the big things, of course, coming up is the uh, chili cook-off. So you want to check that out, too. But the sign-up table back there and all that kind of stuff, a lot of information to be disseminated back there. Um, also, a lot of the stuff can be found on our website at uh, gbcbellevue.org. And we also kind of run it on the screen up here before the service starts, too. So um, for visitors, we normally have uh, uh, high school and middle school uh, groups, Quench and Lifeline and everything. We're not doing some of that because of the holiday weekend here. But uh, normally, those things would happen just right after uh, our service here, too. Uh, ladies, you should have received an email this week listing all of the current and upcoming uh, fellowship events, uh, studies, and all of that kind of stuff. A lot of details uh, are uh, in the newsletter on that, and there's a few copies of that at, at the info table. Also, ladies, Christmas cookie and ornament exchange, Wednesday, December 8th, 6.30 at Julie, uh, Julie Sweets. Um, see Paula or the sign-up table. There she is. Paula's right there. Um, choir practice will be beginning next Sunday after the service. And if you're interested in taking part in that, uh, talk to John and Christine right over there, too. I'm looking forward to that, too. So we're going to start a practice after the service next week. A reminder that our Little Lights will be singing on Sunday, December 19th, too. So... Well, that's another thing to look forward to. Okay, no anniversaries this week, but we have a number of birthdays. Titus Powers is 14 today. <laughs> Ivy Pennington will be 11 on the 30th. <laughs> Kelly Schlesinger, also on the 30th. Thought I saw them come in. Okay. Um, Rich Locke on December 1st. <laughs> Cheryl Haugie and Leslie Frank on the 3rd. <laughs> and Valerie Payton on the 4th. Birthday. Happy birthday to all of you. <laughs> I can tell by people's faces how, how people are so excited when they hear their own name announced for a birthday. It's like, Okay, we do not take up a formal offering here, but there's a white box back there by that one post back there. So if you'd like to help in uh, contributing to the ministry of Grace Bible Church and for all of these things to happen, you're more than welcome to do that. And then also, kids will be dismissed uh, to their classrooms as soon as they have been through the communion line. And we do have a gluten-free option for those with sensitivities for the communion. And Denny is going to come up and bring us uh, that portion of our service and, and get uh, things started. So it's all yours, Denny. You do this very well. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we take uh, the Lord's Supper every uh, Sunday morning service here at Grace Bible Church, Communion. And uh, <clears throat> we believe in open communion here. So if you happen to be visiting with us and you know Christ as your Savior, you have placed your faith in that finished work of the cross, and so you've had the Holy Spirit imparted into you, you are more than welcome to join us in this uh, communion service. 
This is a celebration of the great act that Jesus performed in our place. And we take the, um, uh, the orders from it from Jesus himself. I'm going to read from Matthew, where it's the first time in the Gospels that what we now know as the Lord's Supper is instituted. In chapter 26, verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The body and the wine here, these are symbols for Jesus' physical body and his physical blood. What we do when we take communion now, we actually have three elements. We are looking back to that historic act when Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin in our behalf. And that was accepted by the Father, and it was proven by the fact of the resurrection. But there's an existential element, there's a present element, because right now we are participating in this as a body of God's people. We're remembering what he did. But at the very end, he gives us this promise that he is going to drink of the fruit of the vine with us in the coming kingdom. So we look back, we look at our present experience, but communion is also a time to look forward to that great and glorious dawn of our forever day. Let's pray, and then a couple of the elders will be uh, pointing you, because here at Grace, what we do, we actually get up, and you walk back to the tables on each end, where uh, what we do is we do it in two stages. So we'll be taking a little piece of bread, a little cracker, again, symbolic of the broken body of Jesus. And then after uh, the sermon and a couple of the songs, we finish communion by taking of the fruit of the vine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the historic act of your sacrifice. We count it as history, but we count it as supra history because you did it for us. Lord, help us never forget that awesome love, that awesome grace that is represented in that act. Lord, today as we take communion with one another, we pray that you would give us a sense of togetherness with you, with the triune God, but also with one another, with Christians throughout the world who are participating in this act today. And then, Lord, we ask you to help us think of the future, that day when our troubles will all be over because you will come back as the reigning king the government will set on your shoulders. Death will be destroyed forever. We're looking forward to that day, Lord, and we remember that as we take communion as well. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Allie. Well, good morning again. <clears throat> As we were taking communion, Claire came up and she said, um, do you want a cough drop? I said, well, no, I don't think so. And she gave me one anyhow. And then she said, you might want to take your coffee up with you. So my voice might be a little raspy. Uh, you'll be... Uh, Pleased uh, to hear Dan again. You know, his raspy voice will never again bother you. I got an email from Dan uh, earlier this week asking me about uh, preaching. And after he relieved my heart by letting me know he was not sick, he was just going to be taking a little time off. Well deserved, uh, I might add. He doesn't take uh, nearly as much as I think he should. And as a matter of fact, as much as the board thinks that he should. But he's a very dedicated uh, fellow. 
But uh, he asked me to preach this Sunday, and um, I hesitated at first because we had a very busy week, even though it was a short week. We had two Thanksgiving parties. We had a funeral. We had our regular vital signs activities, including our preparations for our yearly, or not our yearly, well, I guess it is yearly, uh, vital signs ministries. We have these quarterly letter writing parties. And the one that we have uh, at the end of November or 1st of December is a special Christmas card writing party. So we've got to get all that set up, and uh, that was part of it. We had our medical wellness physicals. Some of you don't have to worry about that for a long time. That's good. Um, and we got fairly de- At our age, you only get fairly decent reports. They're never glowing. They're just... Uh, <laughs> If, if they don't tell you, you know, to, to get your house in order, you know it's a pretty good visit. And uh, then messing with the leaves and stuff. But after that initial hesitation, I remembered that he was inviting me to speak on the first Sunday of Advent. And as some of you know, Claire and I are kind of into Christmas. And I thought, well, this is a special honor to be able to address you on this date and with this topic. Always a wonderful treat to uh, entertain the august company of Grace Bible Church, but a special thing today. What is the big deal about Advent? In fact, some of you are saying, what on earth is he talking about? And it's true that evangelicals are not very uh, up on the liturgical calendar. However, that doesn't mean that we can't learn things from it and apply spiritual truths from that study of history. And the fact is, all of you observe certain elements of the liturgical calendar, whether you know it or not. The very fact that you celebrate Christmas on December 25th is, in fact, a practice from the church calendar, or that you celebrate Easter or any one of the other uh, days from the Christian calendar. And then many of you have grown up uh, with Advent calendars. How many of you had that as a kid? Some of you may still do that, where you open up the little boxes. Uh, each one is, uh, represents a day in December, and you open it up, and there's a little meditation or a scripture or hopefully a piece of chocolate. And uh, so that's an Advent uh, calendar. It's celebrating the prelude to uh, the birth of Jesus, to Christmas. And then many of you have come from churches where you have celebrated Advent wreaths, which have a candle, four candles in them, because this, the uh, season of Advent is the four Sundays preceding uh, Christmas. And Advent comes from the Latin means coming or arrival. And so this part of the church uh, calendar, which, by the way, is the beginning of the church calendar, shows you that Jesus Christ is the star of the calendar from the very beginning. All of these things are pointing to Christmas, to Bethlehem and our celebration of the incarnation. However, in the original intent of the liturgical calendar back in uh, the days of the church fathers and for many centuries thereafter, the season of Advent was to celebrate the second coming of Jesus Christ. And as a matter of fact, the uh, gospel texts, which the English Book of Prayer assigns to this particular uh, Advent Sunday, deal very specifically with the second coming. Matthew 24, Mark 13. If you happen to be taking notes, the texts are Matthew 24, verses 37 through 44. And Mark 13, 3 through 7, passages which deal quite explicitly with the second coming of Jesus. That is, when he comes back, not as a baby in a manger, but he comes back on that white horse as the judge of the quick and the dead. He comes back for retribution and justice. That is what is celebrated by Advent. We are not going to explore these texts in detail, but I do want you to note the urgent commands that Jesus gives to his disciples. Again, in the context of his second coming. In the Matthew 24 passage, for instance, verse 42, Jesus says, be on the alert. Verse 44, 
Jesus tells his disciples in relationship to the second coming, which they do not know when it's going to happen. He says, be ready, be ready for it. And in the Mark 13 passage, verse 33, take heed, Jesus says, keep on the alert. Verse 35, therefore, in light of this doctrine, be on the alert. Verse 37, guess what? Be on the alert. So Jesus is saying in these two passages, be on the alert, be ready, keep on the alert, keep on the alert, keep on the alert. Do you think he might have something that he wants his disciples and us to get about the advent? Be alert, alert, be vigilant, keep on watch, be on guard, be ready, because Jesus is coming. Not at Christmas, but Jesus, the sovereign king, is returning. That's on the Advent calendar. Maybe not the one in your home, but it's on God's calendar. The date is set. We don't know when it is. But Jesus says, be ready for it. Be alert. Take heed. Be on guard. So let's consider these two questions. Why is this important? And number two, if it's important, and it is, Jesus keeps repeating it, how do we go about following through with these commands? How do you live in a steady stay of alertness? Well, let's start out with the why. Just going to give you a couple of examples. Living ready, living on the alert for Jesus' return provides tremendous comfort for the Christian particularly for those battle-weary Christians who are diligently trying to be doers of the word and not hearers only. To know that this world is not all there is. Indeed, the struggles and sufferings of this world are but temporary. And our returning king will make all things good. He will not only end these hardships. He will end sin and death. Death and the devil will be kicked into the lake of fire forever. But in addition to all of these, he will reward his faithful sons and daughters for their faithfulness, their loyalty to him in being alert and being ready in the very midst of these hardships. The king has not abandoned us. There is incredible comfort in that. The gracious king is coming and he's coming back for us. Not just to reconcile the world, nature, for instance, which he will do, but he's coming back for that final, ultimate reconciliation of his children and him. He's coming in triumph, he's coming in glory, he's coming in power. And he's taking us to a marvelous place that he's prepared for us personally. So being ready for Jesus yields profound comfort. But that's not all. Living ready for your reunion with Jesus is a tremendous help to your sanctification. That is your pilgrimage, your adventure of walking day by day with Jesus Christ being a work in progress, knowing that God does finish what he starts, and he started a good work in us. He's going to finish that. But we are a work in progress now as we struggle along in our pilgrimage. And knowing that the king is coming, being alert, being ready for that, is a help in our sanctification. Let me give you a great example. This is from 1 John 3, verse 3. And it too is in the context of the believer finally experiencing this face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus. And John said, everyone who has this hope fixed on him, on Jesus. And remember, hope in the New Testament is not a matter of odds. It's not throwing the dice. It's not picking straws. It is a done deal because we have hope in the sure promises of God. He doesn't lie. He finished what he starts. 
And so John said, everyone who has this hope of his return, of his reward, fixed on Jesus, purifies himself. Now think about that. If you're living in readiness, if you're living alert for the second coming of Jesus, if you're anticipating this face-to-face meeting, John says you're purifying yourself. But it's even deeper than that. He says he purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. How's that for a ground-shaking spiritual reality? The purity of Christ himself works in us. And it works through us if we're ready, if we're living alert to the spiritual possibilities. If you live in readiness for the Lord's return, the purity of Jesus helps you along in your pilgrimage. Now, keep in mind that the exhortational phrases that we're talking about today, be ready, be vigilant, be on guard, be watchful, and so on. They are used in Scripture in several other contexts, for instance, in spiritual warfare. In fact, some of you are nodding, saying, well, that, when you started using those verbs, that's what I remembered it. Being watchful, being awake, being defend, uh, having a defensive posture against the devil. It's also used of intercessory prayer. And it's used in several cases of the performance of love and good deeds. That is, being a practice of Christianity, not simply uh, speaking its precepts. But today, on this first Sunday of Advent, with the passages of Matthew 24 and Mark 13, we're concentrating on our readiness for that face-to-face meeting which comes with Jesus' second coming. But I want to introduce one other scripture which not only highlights a couple of elements, but it helps give answer to this question, how do we do it? How do we live in a state of perpetual alert? The scripture is Luke 12, 35, and I've been using this in my meditations for a couple of months now. I love this verse. It reads like this, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Two profound challenges that Jesus issues to his disciples and through the scripture to us. But it's really relevant, this particular passage, the context not only deals with the second coming of Christ. For instance, the context immediately after 1235, Jesus is speaking about a wedding feast, a wedding feast. And he says, how blessed the servants are who have been, quote, on the alert for their master's coming. Verse 38 reads, whether the master comes in the second watch or even the third watch and finds them alert, blessed are those servants. And then to make sure that he gets the point across of the parable, Jesus says in verse 40, to his disciples, you too be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. But here's another cool item about this particular passage. The context afterwards talks about the second coming. The context immediately preceding it is about heaven. That is that face-to-face meeting we have with Jesus before the rapture, and certainly before the second coming. A buddy of ours, we were at his memorial service on Friday. He is a member of our congregation at Exarban Village Senior Living, where Claire and I and a few Vital Signs friends, we conduct a Sunday afternoon church service every Sunday afternoon. And uh, Coach His name is Dennis, but he always goes by Coach. Coach uh, passed away on Friday night, a week ago Friday. We had been with him in the hospital just a couple of days earlier, and uh, he was weakening, and he thought that he was getting ready to go to heaven pretty soon. Just a couple of weeks earlier, 
His health had declined dramatically just in the last month. And he told me one morning, he said, Denny, I really feel like the gates of heaven are opening for me. And he didn't say that with any kind of moroseness. He said it with a wistfulness of desire. The gates are opening. Well, in Coach's case, he's had his face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus prior to the rapture because he died. And he was taken from this sin-scarred earth and his sin-stained body immediately into this face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus, his personal reunion with his master. And that's what Jesus is talking about immediately before this verse 12, 35 in Luke. So it makes reference to the fact that our meeting, whether it's in the air and the rapture and the upward call, or whether through death we enter in to Jordan and experience the well done thou good and faithful servant from Jesus, these exhortational phrases apply. Let's talk about them a little bit. What does he say? Be dressed in readiness. If you have a King James or some of the other verses, it may say, gird your loins. It's a nice word picture for those who used to wear togas, and now he's telling you, wrap yourself up and get ready for action. Because you're not getting dressed up for a costume party, you're not dressing for bed, you're dressing for war. Be dressed in readiness. Be ready for whatever befalls you. It's a military phrase. And of course, it's reminiscent with that military metaphor that you see throughout Scripture. For instance, the weapons of righteousness in 2 Corinthians 6, 7. That whole list of spiritual weapons and spiritual armor from Ephesians 6. And one of my favorites from Romans 13, 12, the armor of light. You see, we are not just dressed to wait. We're dressed to wait on the move, on the march, to be prepared. You know, when I took my fall on Mount Bierstadt this uh, last July, coming off uh, the summit, um, I took a pretty serious fall onto the rocks in um, the boulder field, just off the summit. And I was cut up pretty bad, and I had a pretty bad gash uh, uh, below and above my eye. I was bleeding so bad, we couldn't really even tell where the blood was coming from. But I was prepared, unlike my early attempts when I first started climbing mountains at age 65, those first several trips I was alone. But the last couple of times I have listened to the advice of my wife and I've gone with friends. And in this particular case, there were a couple of young bucks that were going to get us off the mountain, even if we couldn't make it to the top. Well, one of them was right there beside me. And we were able to stop the bleeding and get it patched up enough for me to get down off the mountain because both of us had first aid kits that were well stocked. You see, we had dressed in readiness for what was to come. We layer, and you've got the bug spray, and you've got the uh, skin care stuff to keep from burning. We had all the stuff we needed, plus those first aid kits that had done everything. I've never used that first aid kit in six years, but it was there when I needed it. That's what he's trying to tell us. Jesus says, be dressed in readiness. Be prepared. Be watchful. Be alert. And then keep your lamps lit. The word used here means uh, not so much a torch or a, a, a lamp, but like a lantern. It's something that's movable. And you can set it down for a stationary activity, uh, some kind of domestic task or a meal. But you can also take it along with you. And he says, I want you to keep those lamps lit. Obviously, his disciples would have remembered the parable of the maidens and the anguish and the heartache that they experienced when the master came back and they didn't have enough oil for their lamps. So they knew the force of this command. Keep 
your lamps lit. Now, the applications here are many. Jesus, we're told, is the light of the world. We are told that we are lights of the world in whom we shine in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. But those lights won't shine without being lit. The light of God's word several times, including in the Psalms, when we're told it's a light unto our path. And finally, oil being a symbol throughout the Old and New Testament of the Holy Spirit. Keep your lamps lit. How do you do it? You're a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You practice the word of God. You submit to the Lord in humility and in faith and in gratitude moment by moment. You hang around with sharp Christians who are going to keep you stimulated to love and good deeds, who are going to keep you accountable, who are going to keep the example high, reminding you that the earth isn't the end of the story. Our king is coming back. And when he comes back, he will judge the wicked, but he will reward the righteous, the righteous being those who by faith have placed their trust in Jesus Christ. So as we close, let's go back to Christmas. Advent calendars are not bad. Lighting the Advent candles are not wrong. Indeed, anything that helps you in your spiritual appreciation of the holiday is a good thing, a very, very good thing. You should be thinking about how do I adorn my relationship with Jesus and not just decorate my house for Christmas? What do I do to make sure that I'm a Christmas light to my family and friends, my neighbors? All of that is terrific. Like I said, Claire and I are into Christmas. For many, many years, we used to send out a thing called Making the Most of Christmas to our friends. And it had Christmas stories and poetry and activities, things to do, song lyrics, games. We're into Christmas. I put on one of my blogs just this last week, Christmas reading suggestions. We're all for a thorough preparation for the celebration of the nativity, the incarnation of Jesus. But I urge you this Advent season to make sure that there's an undercurrent, even in your celebration of the nativity, of the Christmas two that is on its way. Christmas not being the celebration of a baby in the manger, but being a celebration of the mighty, righteous judge who's coming back to reward us. Christmas one is a blast. Make it so. But a very helpful hint in that respect is letting Christmas two be part of your celebration. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you came at Christmas and that we have such a glorious past with the prophecies of the Messiah coming, the wonderful accounts in the scriptures of not just the history of Christmas, but then its meaning, its applications to us. Lord, you have treasured us, especially here in the West, with wonderful Christmas stories and literature and poems and music and art and traditions. We are grateful for each and every one. We pray, Lord, that we would appreciate them in a thoroughly spiritual way. But this Advent season, help us to lift our voice in praise of the coming King. Help us to raise our praise to he who is coming back to reward us and create within us a spirit of desire, of alertness, of being watchful and being ready. Lord Jesus, help us keep our lamps lit. Pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. If you'd like to stand with us. Let's worship.
Okay, we're going to conclude our uh, communion service by taking the cup. Again, the cup being symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ. You can all sit down. You'll have to get up in a minute to go. Around. Bless your hearts. Um, and remember, this never grows old. This is uh, the kind of ritual, like anything that we do. It can become routine. But if we are dressed in readiness, if we're keeping our lamps lit, part of the secret is to remember the significance of the things we're commanded to do over and over again. Like remember the Lord's death until he comes. That last song was so perfect, not just for communion, but for the uh, message this morning. We will be hearing that well done, thou good and faithful servant. For some of us, we may hear it before the rapture. I'm praying for the rapture every day. Lord, first Sunday of Advent, be a great day for the rapture. But if he doesn't come, there are some of us that are going to meet him face to face like my friend Dennis did this last week. Let's observe that in great triumph and comfort, knowing that Jesus paid it all. And we celebrate that as we take communion and remember the symbol. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We pray, Lord, that this would not grow old with us, but it would just grow deeper and more profound as each time we participate in this ceremony that you initiated and asked us to continue until you come again in your kingdom. Oh, Lord Jesus, we're waiting for that. We pray this in your name. Amen. band that went over to Xarban last week? Yeah. Was the, I thought it was yeah. you guys. Yeah. You know, John's in this band where there's a bunch of old guys, a bunch of young guys. <laughs> and uh, they're mentors to the young guys. It's such an incredibly cool idea. And we were bumped uh, last week. Our uh, Sunday afternoon service was bumped. We had to go to the morning. That's why we weren't here yesterday. We were at 11. But they were so excited about you guys coming. And how many are in the band? Like 50... 
So they were wondering where they were going to find places for the audience after you guys crowded all in there. But thank you for that's such a great ministry. Uh, one more announcement. Uh, at the uh, literature tables in the back, the information tables, it's pretty important as we're getting set for this chili supper, if you're going to make chili or if you're going to come for chili or if you're going to bake cookies or whatever. So those sign-up sheets are right behind Dave, uh, that marvelous uh, MC with the radio voice um, at the sound controls. Please stop by there and sign up and be a part of these wonderful fellowships. Okay, instead of a prayer, I'm giving you a benediction this morning. Let me be among the first, now that the first Sunday of Advent is actually uh, upon us, let me be one of the first to wish you a very happy Christmas. And the benediction is simply this. Be dressed in readiness and... What's the rest of it? Keep your lamps lit. See you next week. Should we close with the song, Maybe? Oh, I'm sorry. I no, forgot. No, it's fine. That. I just I wanted to. I wanted yeah, yeah. to get a vote if people really wanted to please, or not. Please, yes. <laughs> if they're tired of us. But, but no more benediction. Just the song. No will more be benediction. The, benediction. the song will be done, it. You're clear. All right. If you guys want to stand, please stand. One, two, three, four. Sing his mercy and his grace In the mansions bright and blessed He'll prepare us a place We are the heart to live to live And there are the times that we shall see Sing and shout the victory. victory. I to the prize before us. As soon as beauty will be whole, soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread streets of gold when we are when we are to